Before we start with the content, I would like everybody to look either to the right <laughs> or to the left and enjoy one last time this great view of this great city. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so when we're doing uh, web application security research or application security research, we tend to pick very small problems and beat them until they break apart. And then we are very proud and then we tell the world about this and sometimes we fix them and we tell the world and we're growing prouder. But still they remain rather small, nitty gritty details that we work on. And sometimes it's very good if we talk to people that have a wider view, that have seen a lot of things and that are able to put stuff into context. And these are the people that you in general like to have something like a closing note of a conference like this. And therefore, I'm very glad that we could convince Professor Goldman from the Technical University of Hamburg Harburg, here just in the south, on the wrong side uh, of the River Elbe, um, to tell us um, or to give us his take on the things that we try to uh, negotiate and manage and teach at this conference. And so, with no further ado, Peter Goldman. Thank you very much. for the invitation. My university is, as the French say, a rive gauche, left bank of the river. For the people on this side, Bavaria. <laughs> a way of um, transcribing um, Martin's introduction you ask someone who doesn't know what uh, these people have been talking about, what he took away from these, um, in my case, three days. I was first involved with the workshop Martin organized at our place on Wednesday, and I've been here on and off for the past two days. As I've seen on the previous talks, um, slide number two is, who am I? Where am I coming from? And I also see that um, you like riddles. This is a very good description of what I've been doing. And it shouldn't be too difficult to crack if your background is in German or English. Most of the words make sense. I've been in this trade as an academic, once I was at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. I've been trying to understand what's going on in computer security, written a textbook on this topic, and uh, as my Dutch friends told me, you cannot have a talk without an advertisement, uh, so I've made it to edition number three of my book, and it's slowly getting deeper into web security, web application security. As a hint to the riddle on the previous slide, which direction to look? I'm one of the co-organizers of NordSAC 2013, putting my Danish hat on. I was once uh, a junk professor at uh, the IMM at the Technical University of Denmark, and we decided to take the annual Nordic Conference on Secure IT System to La Danemark Outremer, Greenland. And there are still some places left on the plane. So if you're interested, in an interesting conference with interesting speakers, we have uh, David Basin from ETH Zurich as one of the keynote speakers. We have Gilles Barth as one of the keynote speakers. Um, join us. That is the link where you'll find more. To the topic, computer security. You have a quote here. The problem 
we've been talking about, arises from a combination of factors. That includes the extension of resource sharing concepts to networks of computers, the slowly growing recognition of security inadequacies of currently available computer systems. The language isn't quite fashionable for concepts you could immediately apply. The web, a network of computers, awareness that uh, there are security inadequacies. How old is this statement? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? We can, could have a spread betting exercise. Um, my English background would like this, but it's not something to do here in Germany. So I will tell you Anderson Report 1972. We've been here for the past 40 years. You could discuss, is this good news? Is this bad news? Are we making progress? Are we moving in circles? Is there something to learn? Picking up some of the comments from the previous days. Ah, things are getting much too complex. And the quote here is again from the Anderson Report, the emergence of complex resource sharing computer systems. The first thesis I want to put forward to you. The problem isn't that the systems are complex. The problem is that we are bad at talking about them. We have to work on our language. Martin had been asking on Wednesday, or had been saying on Wednesday, the web. I don't know what it means. I'm not the first in security to put up this slide, or this quote. I've seen it years ago from Chuck Flieger, who also is the author of one of the major textbooks in this area. Humpty Dumpty, talking to Alice, the Alice in Wonderland, but that is part two through the looking glass. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more or less. Which is a good piece of advice. You might um, want stronger authority than Humpty Dumpty to take this view. So, what about Ludwig Wittgenstein? another Austrian who spent time in Cambridge. In his second spell in Cambridge, he came to the conclusion words don't have an innate meaning. Looking for that meaning in the Kantian sense of philosophy. Forget about it. He made himself unpopular with quite a few people at that time. His view was words are tools for conversations. So in that sense, for the language we need to talk about web application security, we can pick the words that are useful for the conversations we need to have. Not uh, 40 years back, Cert Advisory CA 2002 on malicious HTML tags embedded in client web requests. At that time, I was sitting in an office at Lions Yard in Cambridge. And in the office next to me was a guy who once in a while came over to me and said, mm, Japanese character sets. What a nightmare. Japanese character sets. He was working on this third advisory. And if you're interested later, I can tell you why he was so agitated about Japanese character sets. Back to my thesis to my agenda. What 
is a malicious attack. Attack is attack. It has no benevolence. It has no malice. Levin in his talk was also mentioning Mauritius code, and I see it a lot being used. I'll ask my students, if I'm the attacker, if I put on my web page strange code that uh, goes through various contortions to extract the cookie I've just set in your browser, is this malicious? Your browser sending my cookie back to me is a service. It's a feature. It's not an attack. But if my code comes through a different website, yes, it is attack. But it's not then a property of the code, whether it's malicious or not. But maybe about how it's being used. I'll come back to that. Another quote from the suit advisory. Because one source is injecting code into pages sent by another source, this vulnerability has also been described as cross-site scripting, at that time still with quotation marks. Now I learned something yesterday. There is cross-site scripting not involving any script. You can invoke Wittgenstein and say words mean what I say they mean. And I use cross-site scripting in a way that you don't need any scripting and it's still cross-site scripting. And I will tell you, please don't. I try to teach my students about software security, about website security. And having to explain to them there is a term called cross-site scripting, but it doesn't involve scripts necessarily. I will not be very successful in getting any clear idea across what the nature of the problem is. This, in my view, has to do with the way we perceive attacks, understand attacks. And I have um, three angles. Angle number one, we can look at the method by which the attack is executed. And I should say, before I go into details, the angle we are adopting will also influence the countermeasures that come to our mind. So, we could say, in line with what you've seen in the search advisory, it's code being injected, scripts being injecting, it's a code injection attack, which it is. And then we defend against code injection through encodings, through intrusion detection systems, through clever ideas, maybe even sandboxing to some extent might fit in here. We can, and I jump to the third point, look at the effect of the attack in terms of the application. Cookie stealing as one of the standard examples for cross-site scripting attacks. I'm giving courses on security. If you know German universities, there is an exercise class going with it. And very early on in one of those courses, the PhD student who was in charge of the exercise classes gave a live cookie-stealing cross-site scripting demo. Impressive. Oh. It works. At the end of the term, examinations. What is cross-site scripting? Well, you steal a cookie. And the effect at that level takes over. And then your defense might be, take the cookies away from the attacker. HTTP only cookies. Sessions not created using cookies, but some in some other fashion. You could, final point on this slide, look into the system and ask which security property has been violated. 
And then, when I see cross-site scripting attack, I see an elevation of privilege attack. My script, the attacker script, doesn't run with my access rights. It runs with somebody else's access rights. If I take that view, I'm moving to access control. And that is then my second thesis in this concluding notes. I'd like to look at cross-site scripting as an access control problem and see how far that gets me in understanding the nature of potential countermeasures or understanding the state of the art. Access control. Who teaches access control of us academics in any of our courses anymore? There is a well-established language dating back, as I'm saying here, definitely 1980s, but um, quite a few of the very influential papers are from the 1970s. Yeah. And this language uses terms like principles, subjects, objects, access operations, reference monitor. I might disclose the identity of a reviewer, mine. Uh, for a conference, I was looking at a paper and they implemented an enforcer in Android. Why do you invent a new word? It's a reference monitor. It's been around 1970s. No need to fall into the marketing trap and um, invent new words for old things. So, to remind myself, what are principles? An entity that can be granted access to an object or can make statements affecting access control decisions. The latter point I'd often call delegation. Subjects operate on behalf of principles. Access is based on the principles and names bound to the subject in some unforgeable manner at authentication time. This is a quote from a paper by Mori Gasser. Mori Gasser was a digital research where they had a big effort in distributed system security, access control for, dis for distributed systems, late 1990s, early 1990s. Mori Gasser had written a book on computer security, capturing the state of the art at that time, which I think is now available for free on the web because it's no longer in print. That is this well thought through view of the world if you go into the theoretically considerations of access control of that time they use terms like a subject speaking for a principle. Those who have been in theoretical security will remember. Those who know Martin Abadi, he was very much involved in this type of work 20, 25 years ago. I have to admit, uh, I'm sliding in, not in this talk more generally, into the role of a historian of computer security. And if I go back in history to where these ideas come from, again, 1970s, 1980s, closed organizations, and quoting Maury Gasser again, principal names had to be globally unique, human readable and memorable, easily and reliably associated with known people. There is a dangerous twist of this. People tend to confuse the instance of a concept with the concept itself. Access control based on user identities does not equal access control. It's the access control of the 1970s and 1980s, sometimes called identity-based access control. I'd call it uh, user-centric access control. And this 
is a wonderful world, security-wise. It's so simple. You have one entity. It owns the policy. It sets the policy. It enforces the policy. It owns the resources that need to be protected by the policy. There is no conflict of interest. There is no question, do I trust this other party, whatever trust means. All in house, all in one. Nice. Now, I have seen it on Wednesday, I've seen it yesterday in this conference. Applications are becoming principles. So I'm not the only one saying, um, we have to think about what's going on in the web in terms of access control concepts. So I'm excited. What are these principles? If we use principles in the established terminology, we don't have to do it, we can invent a new one. If we do so, our policies have to refer to principles. So we have to name them. Access requests have to be authenticated. We have to know for which principle is the subject making the access request speaking for. And we need to set policies. And in that terminology, I say principles need to be authorized to do this and that. How to name an application? Write a manifest, have a field name, write a name into it, show this to an access control guy and say, that's the name we're going to use for access control. He'll fall over laughing. Names have to be unique. There had been a huge discussion around early 1990s, unique in which respect. Do we need globally unique names? And the security distributed access control community said no. Local names, but locally unique names. But they need to be, in a way, unforgeable. Levin, in his talk just before the break, using domain names, in a way, as name for application, and then the domain expires and somebody else takes the same name, and you have messed up. Of course. How could you be so silly to use such names for access control? Access requests need to be authenticated. It is this question, which principle is a subject speaking for? I've seen a lot of interest in CSP, which I share. And to me, CSP falls into this category um, making statements about uh, this piece of code is allowed to speak for me, this piece of code is not allowed to speak for me. And then setting policies. Of course, which application is allowed to talk to which application, how? So there are ideas around, and to me they all fit into this framework, access control, where applications are principles. That is my view of a very mad world. There is a web server that sends a policy in an HTTP header, be it uh, a pre-flighted course request, uh, be it some CSP header. And uh, the browser then is asked to enforce the policy. My first question, whose interest is reflected in the policy? Because everything that follows will depend on this. Does the policy refer to data the application wants to protect? Or does the policy refer to data the user at the client side wants to protect privacy? my cookies, my personal data. A 
couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, I had a student uh, and I had asked her, I'm now hearing so much about course, write your master thesis on course, tell me what is this, tell me what security it provides, as opposed tell me what claims about the security are being made. And she was explaining to me this old scheme with pre-flighted request and the browser receiving the policy from the server and I asked her, well, why does the browser trust this? Okay, I haven't thought about it. A couple of weeks later she came back and said I got in contact with the working group and the working group told me, ah, you were asking um, a completely wrong question, it's not about uh, protecting anything at the client side, it's really protecting the application. But, she said, if you then look at uh, the blogs of people talking about course, they want to protect the client. They are confused about the goals of the policy already at that level. Another point of madness. Why does the server expect that the browser enforces the server's policy? I don't see any good reason, other than saying, this is the average user, they won't mess around with the browsers, they are not interested in whatever you call it, jailbreaks, and so on. You might have a better argument if you say, it's about enforcing the user's interest, so the user has no interest in uh, screwing himself up. Yes. But if it's about enforcing the server's policy, the application's policy, the interests of the applications. Why should I care as a user? These questions will need to be answered. Coming slowly to my end, if applications are the new principles, and I think it's a worthwhile idea to pursue, what are the subjects? And a subject in the old world was in essence a process. A process in this user-centric world running under a user identity. So, I'm asking you, the technical expert, what are the units of computation, reasonably well isolated, where you can say this unit of computation is running on behalf of an authenticated principle. And I'm not sure that authentication time, which I've copied from Morigas's definition, is the right word. That might come from a time when the idea was you log in, authenticate yourself as a person, now a process is created that runs under your user identity. Maybe it has something to do with loading the application, things like that. I'd be interested in your answer. Then I'd learned something about uh, the W3C draft on uh, runtime and security model for web applications. And uh, talking to this old security community, you will hear comments, ah, once we had models, Bella Padula, Clark Wilson, Biber, Chinese Wall, no models left. I got, again, quite curious, heard about it on Wednesday, printed it out on Thursday, read it, and I didn't find a model. I found lots of interface specifications, which is natural and reasonable, and typically for that community, typically in a positive sense, that's how everything has grown. But I didn't see a security model, I would, I would recognize, in terms of access control, with principal subjects, policies, who is making statements about policies, who is enforcing policies, and the like. And I think the standard, um, or this draft, will have to move in this direction if it wants to meet this promise of uh, developing a security model for web applications. So, this is the closing note of the closing note. Again, something uh, I'd heard definitely on Wednesday, maybe also at other times. Uh, things are moving so quickly, changing so quickly. Internet times, 
in my times at Cambridge, uh, Roger Needham was my lab director, and the terrible speed of the internet uh, was a discussion topic 10, 10, 15 years ago. And he said, ah, internet times. The wheel of reincarnation is spinning faster. which might not be a bad idea to do. And go back to these ideas about access control, access control in distributed systems, early 1990s, see what applies, see what the differences are, get a better understanding of this uh, very interesting interplay between various parties uh, connected in the web. And that is the end, I'll say, to remind you, you'll meet me next um, in this place, here, with the view on the ice fjord of Ilolesat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think for you've gave us all a lot of things about on the way home. But if you don't want to wait until Greenland to Ask your questions to Professor Goldman. Now would be a good chance. Any questions? Ah, obviously, in the back. Hi, Monica. I actually don't have question, but like two comments. The first one, you're talking about cores, and you said. Um, one second. So you said that uh, with cores, it's not sure what are we trying to protect, right? We're enforcing the security policy for the server or for the client. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not more about what we're trying to protect in terms of server because to so protect the server, we already have same origin policy for that. What course does is actually provide you a mechanism for the users and the features it provides to the users that they want to do course cross domain access despite the same original policy. But if it's sorry, if it's a user's interest, why does the server tell the user about the policies? Yeah, but the or, or why does the application tell the user of the application what the user's policy ought to be? Yeah, because the user cannot tell the server about the policy because if every user starts defining that, then we have a problem with providing that's, that's like providing that's like saying the user defines security, and you can't expect the user to define security. User does not know what security is. It would be hard. It would be way more complicated than just, I don't know, users can define more features than by security. And uh, the second comment that I wanted to make was you were talking about the, uh, uh, there's a lack of security models for applications that use principles and identities and stuff like that. Actually, I'm working on a private project that actually goes in this direction, but you can't really see it right now because it's not published at the moment. Um, just wanted to make a comment on that. Thank you. So um, you, you raised the question why access control policies might not be enforced uh, or defined on client side and, and enforced there. No, no, I did raise the question. I was just observing a setup where one party defines the policy and expects another party to enforce it. Okay. And I'm asking, this is, why th this expectation? Okay, th this is fair enough. But uh, maybe we can see it as the approach to uh, get over the, the purely client-side policy, which we used to have. It's uh, the same origin policy, which we learned to, to get over. And maybe the approach to have not a static policy, uh, but instead dynamic policies that are redefinable mm -hmm. only on server side. Uh, but there is no doubt a conflict of interest, so you're, I completely agree with this. Um, yeah. Do you want to say something to it? Yeah. So yeah. I'll uh, hand the discussion to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so thank you very much for your talk. I found it very good. Um, uh, you talked about cores and CSP yeah. and about trust. And I think um, um, 
when you want to understand trust, you also have to think about incentives. Um, and when we talk about incentives, I want to uh, I, I want to to add another technique that is browser plugins such as uh, NoScript or uh, AdBlock, AdBlock Plus, and uh, things like that. So. And a year ago or so, uh, or until a year ago, every one of us was using AdBlock because uh, we were trusting the makers of AdBlock that we don't want to see any ads. And now in the recent months, uh, we saw what the real incentives of the AdBlock makers were because now when you want to place ads, you can pay AdBlock that they will let their ads, so my ads, will get through your site even though you use AdBlock, right? So it's... Um, I think you also have to think about the incentives. I think that comes back to Martin's remark, what is the web? And you could say, it's a commercial infrastructure. It has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with various players offering services, advertisements, um, uh, having interesting revenue models. Um, I had a seminar course on internet auctions for my students, so they get a feeling for what is going on in the background, which if you only talk about security protocols and encryption access control, never turns up. This is this business layer of the web. Yeah, here speaks yeah. the business layer of the web. Uh, <laughs> Boris. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, please let me come back to Wittgenstein. Um, what is an application? Is an application the code running on the server? Is the application the code, the JavaScript code running in the browser? Is it both? And when it's, it is both, it is maybe reasonable that the server tries, tries to enforce the policy on the browser? You no, know, the, the, the policy is always enforced. In that setup, yeah. the policy is enforced in the browser. The server can state it, but doesn't enforce it. But the server could, of course, also try to enforce some. This was my meaning policy. of twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but maybe the application is uh, the complete system uh, with the server and the client based code. I agree that it will be a non-trivial task to decide what do we mean by application and uh, conjoint to that, how do we then name applications? It seems to me that uh, as a community we have taken the intellectual shortcut and said, okay, applications are hosted on hosts and hosts have host names um, and uh, so we use host names to name our applications. And it works, sort of, until it breaks. I think this is a fantastic last word. Oh, no, there is a fantastic last word. <laughs> so in the context of trying to define what an application is, wouldn't it make more sense to focus on uh, sorry, in, and in the context of distributed applications, wouldn't it make more sense to define an application as being uh, a separate component based on where that code resides? So the code that resides in the browser is, for all intents and purposes, a separate application than the code that resides on the server, and that those communication boundaries define how you name the individual components of the application and where you define those trust boundaries and where you enforce those policies. You could try. Thomas, wait a second. Sorry. I can't resist, but we're, the instance concept confusion that's occurring here is we are having two conversations that overlap. The first one is how can we, in a clean way, think about the terrible mess that the web security model is. That is a partially descriptive conversation where 
the question then turns uh, turns into if we think about it in a clean way, are there new ways to name things? Are there perhaps new security boundaries that can develop? Are there out security boundaries that can develop holes, which is the case with cars? The second discussion is, is there a different way we could think about a security framework for something for the web? And I think being very clear what mode we are in as we're talking really helps. And I think that the, the, the comment about a lot of the conversation in cases like course being terribly confused about how, uh, terribly confused between the normative and the descriptive and terribly confused about what actually is going on is spot on and I actually agree that the security model and um, execution context spec is not a security model. One additional point there, identifiers we are seeing a lot of playing around with the origins concept and with naming and we've seen mm -hmm. that over the past about five years. Um, Chrome extensions are an example where uh, key material starts to serve, public keys start to serve as an origin equivalent. We're seeing something similar being thought about in the app URI scheme. There is, uh, is thinking about extending actually the HTTP URI scheme, trying to keep the naming framework but build something else. So that is actually an area of active development where it is then interesting to look at a more a cleaner representation of the various entities we are dealing with, the boundaries between them, and then perhaps a good opportunity to do something interesting with naming. But just changing naming ain't gonna change anything. You need to really have the clean descriptive model and we don't have that. And to add to that, public keys as principles, you'll find in the early 1990s in the discussion of access control and raising an interesting confusion of his public keys and subjects or principles, which I don't think was ever properly resolved. So every further discussion is postponed until Greenland. And <laughs> thanks, Dieter German again. Now I would like to get Dirk up front for the closing ceremony. <laughs>